queering phenomenology. So before we can get into discussions on gendered spaces and racialized territories, we first want to examine the role and the impact of the philosophy of phenomenology on architectural discourse. Phenomenology uh, was developed in Germany in the late 19th century, and it, it was a way of discovering this transcendental experience of what it means to be in and towards the world. It what created this endless task of stripping away uh, so-called distractions and layers of life or in life as a way of orienting oneself to this original starting point to create um, this foundation of embodied experience. And um, you can see a list of contributors, contributors here to this philosophy along the top and then the architects along the bottom that appropriated the philosophy into architectural discourse. And you can see there's a, a series of responses from um, the generations from modernism to postmodernism, and then in the 80s and 90s. And it was first appropriated during modernism as a way of creating um, an architectural theory and uh, foundation of knowledge within the universities. And then during uh, postmodernism, phenomenology was used to create a sense of meaning and uh, you know, poetic meaning, and then this call for a return to the primitive embodied experience. And this was really a European Enlightenment viewpoint on um, which, which drove this, this strive uh, for primitive experience. And David Theodore put it this way, that architectural phenomenology has tended to understand historical specificity as supervening on a universal phenomenological body. In other words, in order to return to our, our starting point, we have to remove all of our preconceived notions and the historical, cultural, social layers that, that have um, been added upon our lives. And even though this um, list of contributors is not comprehensive, it does demonstrate the point that the, the folks that are exploring this subjective embodiment were really uh, one type of of being in the sense that they are Eurocentric, cisgendered white men. And we'll see the effect that this had on architectural discourse. During modernism, um, there's, there was what we call the ethical project in architecture and phenomenology played a role in this. Uh, it positioned the universal body as the starting point and as the goal and aimed at creating a sense of completeness and wholeness. Alberto Perez Gomez, said that a phenomenological approach can produce architecture that allows the inhabitants to recognize a potential wholeness through experience. So architectural phenomenology, in order to do this, it looked at and co-opted other disciplines of science, um, social science, uh, neurobiology, cognitive science, as a way of um, defining subjectivity that was science-based. And they use this in order to create um, meaning and humanistic completeness through place. Merleau-Ponty calls being in and towards the world the body schema. And you look at the relationship of the viewer um, that is viewing two objects. And architectural phenomenology treats this relationship between the viewer and the objects as a uni universal experience through this subjective perspective. And it strove, um, it helped to strive for this experience of, of what a primitive embodiment could be. In order to achieve this, Edmund Husserl said, um, and he posed the idea of a pake, which is to suspend judgment and attitude and, and critique, and combine that with the action of reduction, which is to strip away context, learned ideas, and preconceived notions. So these two operations together turn the focus towards this transcendental consciousness. And it leads to what Norbert Schultz calls root subjectivity and identity. Um, this root subjectivity of, of returning to this primitive home, this, this sense of dwelling. And it's, it's really a, a Eurocentric philosophy which puts forward an ideal type of subject, which is the colonizing white, male, enlightened, straight um, person, 
And all of this led to this call for, um, and really elevating the idea of dwelling and domesticity. By deploying reduction to strip away context and historical layers, and by um, kind of rejecting the idea or the experience of being uprooted, architectural phenomenology really marginalizes difference um, in the sense that it marginalizes folks of other races and classes and genders because it centers a certain type of being by glorifying a particular embodied experience and way of life. It focuses on providing stability through dwelling and through domesticity and through home, home, homeliness. Um, and it also led to an intellectualized domination of culture and design. And in the 80s, we find um, a rejection to this notion of normalized phenomenology. And instead of root identity, which is shown in the diagram on the left here, which is that call for, for uh, dwelling, Edward Glissant explores the experience of relational identity. And that's demonstrated on the diagram to the right here. This is an identity not linked to a creation of the world, but to the conscious and contradictory experience of contact among cultures. There's a sense of transience, of, of being uprooted, of being displaced, there's imbalance. And there's also the practice of going on and with the land rather than grasping it and dominating it. So it's critiquing enslavement, it's critiquing racial capitalism and colonialism. In his book, Black Skin, White Masks, Franz Fanon said that being called a Negro made him an object among other objects. So he didn't get to, to experience this um, universal subjectivity. Um, his, his sense of embodiment had become destabilized and was split into what Webb Dubois terms double consciousness. Um, it's where you're always looking at yourself through someone else's eyes. Um, he's both an American, but he's also a black person. And the idea of being black was put onto him and projected onto him by others. He calls this projective practice, where other people project upon you, your embodiment. And it really impacts how uh, black people, and um, Fanon in particular, occupy public space, uh, where everyday activities from making a phone call, lighting a cigarette, writing a check, you become super intentional about what you're doing with a heightened and intensified sense of awareness because you have become objectified and, and displaced um, to the sense that you feel you don't belong. Merleau-Pawney, um, he went on to say that embodied experiences already come with a pre-existing past. You're already situated and signified. And this creates notions of facticity, where there are facts about you and your embodiment that are outside of you. So you're both a subject because you have an internalized consciousness, but you're also an object um, because there are facts outside of you that determine um, what and who you are. And he calls this duplicitous. I point this out because the black phenomenological body has become an object in front of this white transcendental horizon. Um, the black body is objectified and because of that, there's no possibility for, true, for a true return to primitive embodiment. Um, being black has been reduced completely to facticity and it has been objectified as the other. And being black means that you don't fully truly own your sense of embodiment. Michelle Foucault asserted that when we state with experience, when we start with experience and embodiment, we're already preloading the conversation in a way that really makes it difficult to consider multiple forms of bodies and experiences. And it's starting with that one ideal um, experience. And Sarah Ahmed um, responds to this and really grabs hold of Merleau-Pawney's uh, notion of facticity and takes it a step further and poses that the experience of becoming objectified is where you become the object and the world around you has to orient towards you. And the, the place of subjectivity lies with outside of you. So it's transgressing the no, notion of subjectivity. And what this does is it, it challenges the way that we um, 
that we face the oriented world, um, the way that we face the sense of place, and the sense that we are constantly allowing ourselves to be unveiled to new experiences, to the, to the experience of being displaced and, and the experience of being disoriented. She claims that different positions or other forms of embodied experience are actually not inferior. Um, this is really a feminist approach saying that alternative mo modalities of human existence uh, are just as valid and just as appreciated as the master subject white man. And in the 80s, um, again, we, we see this radicalized notion of phenomenology that completely rejects the idea of seeking rootedness and um, rejects binary notions of being oriented or disoriented. Instead, they appreciate the idea of being uprooted, of, of non-dwelling, of unhomeliness. And instead of focusing on the idea of wholeness and transcendental universalization, it instead prioritizes existence that is constantly integrating and disintegrating, um, that is constantly being oriented and disoriented. So there's a flux and a transience to this type of phenomenology. Bell Hook said, I'm located in the margins, and it's in the margins where we find sites of oppression and resistance. So this phenomenology is not about aesthetics or ornamentation but it's more about the spatial considerations of black American communities. And it's, a, it's how these communities have really transformed the notion of value and um, this value system, because they've had to operate within spaces that have been um, seen as mundane or obsolete or, or kind of the in-between spaces, the spaces that Rem Koolhaas um, defines as junk space. And so, um, really this phenomenology of blackness wants to express those material conditions of having to make do with what's been left over, um, left over after um, industrial modernism and global capitalism.